Hello again, and welcome to College Algebra. Today, we're going to be building up a library of function examples. We're going to start with a humble, yet literally pivotal, example, the so-called identity function. Going with the theme of descriptive function names, I'll symbolize this function as id of x. Here's what it looks like. Its equation is y equals x, the line that splits the difference between the x and y axes. Identify the function with its y value, and we have id of x equals x. Its symmetry is obvious, but we'll verify it algebraically, plugging in negative x for x, noting id of negative x is negative id of x, and concluding the id function has odd, or origin, symmetry. There are three kinds of identity functions lurking about here and it's important not to confuse them. Identities are always relative to an operation. A function can be an identity under addition or subtraction, multiplication or division, or composition. The identity under addition is the zero function. Its graph is the x-axis, where y equals zero. Add it to a function, and the function remains identical. The identity under multiplication is the one function. Multiply it by a function, and the function remains identical. But this id function, arguably the most important, is the identity under function composition. Compose it with a function, and the function remains identical. We'll look at composition in much more detail in another video. For now, just remember that the id function is relative to function composition. Every function has an explicit domain and range. The id function is a polynomial, and like all polynomials, its domain, as a function on the real numbers, is all the real numbers between negative infinity and positive infinity. Like all odd degree polynomials, its range is also all the real numbers between negative and positive infinity. The graph of an inverse function is always its reflection across this line. Because the id function is its own reflection across itself, it is one of the rare functions that is its own inverse. Our next library function is the reciprocal function, our first discontinuous example. The reciprocal function looks like this. Its equation is y equals 1 over x, which means its graph consists of the points x, 1 over x. Check its symmetry algebraically by plugging in negative x, and confirm what's visually obvious, that the reciprocal function is an odd function with origin symmetry. This function has another important symmetry. It's symmetric around the line y equals x, the graph of the identity function. This means the reciprocal function is another example of a function that is its own inverse. This function has two continuous regions defining its domain and range. It's discontinuous at x equals 0 because you can't divide by 0. Its domain is given by the disjoint intervals from negative infinity to 0 and 0 to positive infinity. Now, because it is its own inverse, its domain is also its range. The next function for the library is the absolute value function. The absolute value function looks like a v it takes a sharp turn at the origin. Its equation is y equals absolute value of x, and its graph is given by the points x, abs x. We can verify its symmetry algebraically by plugging in negative x, noting this is equivalent to abs x, and concluding that the absolute value function is even, that is, it has y-axis symmetry. This is an example of an even function that is not the sum, difference, product, or quotient of even degree polynomials. This function is pointy, not smooth, at the origin. This means it goes directly from decreasing to increasing without becoming constant, even for a moment. Because it's not smooth at the origin, it doesn't have a distinguishable tangent line, and so there's no tangent line with zero slope, which is the mark of a constant function. Even though it's not smooth, because the function is continuous, we can read its domain and range from the width and height of the one continuous region. The function accepts x values between negative and positive infinity and returns y values 
between zero and positive infinity, which defines the domain and the range. We're going to look at the square and square root functions together. The square function and the square root function are intimately related. Where the square function has the equation y equals x squared, the square root function has the equation y equals square root x, which is almost equivalent to the inverted square equation x equals y squared. The graph of the square function includes all of the points x, x squared, where the graph of the square root function includes half of the reflections through the identity function y equals x. Negative square roots are excluded to satisfy the vertical line test and preserve the function. The square function is the archetypical even function. Its exponent is 2, which is even, and so it's symmetric around the y-axis. The square root function wants to have x-axis symmetry, but we don't let it, and so it ends up with no symmetry at all. It's entirely a first quadrant function, has no reflections across the y-axis into the second quadrant, and no reflections across the origin into the third quadrant. The domain and range of the square function can be read off the graph. Like all polynomials, it accepts all real values for x, while it ranges from 0 to positive infinity. As befits a nearly inverse function, the domain of the square root function is the range of the square function. But because we exclude the symmetry across the x-axis, the range is restricted to non-negative real numbers. The cube and cube root functions are even more intimately related. They are actual inverse functions. Where the cube function has the equation y equals x cubed, the cube root function has the equation y equals cube root x, which is exactly equivalent to the inverted cube equation x equals y cubed. Where the graph of the cube function includes all the points x, x cubed, the graph of the cube root function is its reflection through the line y equals x, the equation of the identity function. The cube function is clearly odd. x cubed 3 is odd, and is thus symmetric across the origin. Now, where even functions can't have inverses unless you restrict the domain, as we did with the square function, the inverse of an odd function inherits its odd symmetry. The domain of any polynomial, including y equals x cubed, is the entire real line, and the range of any polynomial of odd degree, like 3, is also the entire real line. The domain of a function's inverse is the range of the function, and the range of the inverse is the domain of the function. Exponential and logarithmic functions are inverses of each other. We'll be looking more closely at exponential and natural log functions in another video. For now, notice how their equations are written, learn to recognize their graphs, and remember that they are inverses. The graph of the exponential function is always positive. It grows slowly at first and then outstrips every other function in our library. The graph of the natural log function is reflection of the exponential function through the line y equals x. It grows very quickly at first and then falls behind all of our other library functions. These functions have no symmetries. The domain of the exponential function is all real numbers, but it ranges only over positive numbers. As the inverse of the exponential function, the natural log function's domain is the range of the exponential, and its range is the domain of the exponential. With functions in our library, we know how to build new functions by adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing them. Later, we'll look at building more through transformations and compositions. But next up, we'll consider building new functions by stitching old functions together.